welcome to our podcast and those of you viewing on YouTube, uh, thank you very much for joining us. The um, intent of this discussion is to elicit some interesting conversation around topics that are thought provoking and interesting. Um, I'd like to introduce James, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Hi, Phil. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully we're going to have a lot of fun talking about my favorite subject, which is uh, LiDAR systems, laser range finders, lasers and cool physics. So uh, those are my passions, those are my interests. Let's see where this goes. Great, thank you, James. Uh, my name is Philip Constantine. Um, we are testing a new format today, so uh, bear with us. And uh, we look forward to carrying you through a conversation on some interesting topics in the weeks to come. Um, James, today I thought that we'd talk about the evolution of LiDAR. Um, I think very often people imagine that LiDAR is something quite recent. And uh, you and I were having some discussions recently on, you know, what the origins of LiDAR might be. So maybe let's head down this track and see where we get to in terms of the uh, origins of LiDAR and love to pick your brain on your thoughts on where this technology originated and uh, where it might be going. Um, my understanding is that really, I mean, it's kind of started with a laser around the 60s um, and this laser was invented. I know Howard Hughes was involved in his company. Um, and suddenly they built this amazing tool, but it didn't have a job. Um, and how did that then result in LiDAR? What was interesting is not only did the laser not have a job, but even the concept of a LiDAR as we understand it today didn't exist at that time. Mm. I think that you know many people who look at the evolution of technology tend to use a parallel with electronics, let's say, where you assume that electronics has been around for hundreds of years and uh, follows certain laws of evolution and so on. But this, whilst this has been popularized in things like Moore's law, that doesn't mean that all technology evolution follows the same kind of path. And often there are stops and starts. There is the commercialization of a technology, which can follow a very different history to the physics of a technology, for example. And laser range finding, lasers and LIDAR have almost run multiple parallel paths depending on the commercial applications. So it wasn't just a simple case of coming up with a piece of physics like a laser and saying, we are going to apply this to this amazing application. In fact, quite the contrary for many years, people are struggling to decide exactly what to do with it. In fact, there's even a huge debate as to who was the first one to get a laser to work. Um, needless to say, the Russians have their own ideas, the Americans have their own ideas, and the Europeans have their own ideas. Um, nonetheless, a, an interesting academic exercise during the 1960s um, to convert the concept of what was known as a maser, originally a microwave amplifier, into something that was a light, a light amplifier. And um, uh, needless to say, light tends to be a lot harder to deal with at the physics level than microwaves because they're much shorter wavelengths. So the precision of manufacture required to make a laser was orders of magnitude more difficult than try, try and make a maser. But it was surprisingly successful. And I've always wondered why that was the case, because you're mixing some fundamental laws of physics with some chemistry and some material science and, yeah. you know, optics and, and trying to understand all of these things and without rubies. any true purpose. Rubies, rubies, can you imagine? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why would you pick these exotic materials if you didn't have a, a strong view in mind as to what you were going to do with it? Mm. Um, I think that, you know, just the idea of even to trying to generate coherent light or a narrow beam or something that I'm sure we can do something with this if we could just make it work must have been very tantalizing and, and very exciting to the original researchers. I think if they saw what we were doing with lasers today, they would be absolutely shocked because in many respects, we don't use them just for the simple laws of physics that define them. Mm. We, we find applications and then try and adapt the, the technology in the best possible way to make it solve our problems. You know, the, the problems are far more important than the physics in many respects. Mm. Um, so the complex ev evolution, I think, you can, you can follow it from a physics perspective. But I think it's important to recognize that the physics of lasers generally have not changed since the days of Albert Einstein. And then in fact, the same rules, um, the same rules of quantum mechanics and the same rules with regards to the speed of light and uh, a number of fundamental things 
still remain and we still have to work within that framework we can't bend the rules of physics we try but we can't we can't really bend them um, however the application of those rules is where the fun has has really lay and uh, uh, we've done so many things with these lasers uh, you know in the past 50 or 60 years it's it's quite amazing what people have come up with so i mean what was the turning point because if we look at you know, the initial lasers and, you know, it, it was 1960, you know, um, you know, we go back to, to Kennedy's speech, um, you know, we choose to go to the moon, we choose to go to the moon because it's hard, you know, do you think, I mean, was the space race and, and, and the, the, the need to kind of, you know, measure distance to satellites and things like that, do you think that that was, it was an impetus for, you know, for, for a lot of this laser technology and how it kicked off and and maybe then kind of was the leapfrog in, into the next age, um, you know, heading towards the lighter applications we see today? It's such a fundamental question that because at, at, a, at a philosophical level, we're trying to define what it is that uh, creates the conditions for innovation. Why do mm. things suddenly emerge? And the 1960s was a fascinating time. When you think that we have the SR-71 Blackbird flying around, we have people building rockets to the moon, we have so many things that had never yeah. been done before. Computers were beginning to come on stream as real commercial products. Yeah. Um, and the, the laser was just another one of these amazing technologies. It was almost like at the time people knew no boundaries, no limits, and they just mm. let their imagination carry them forwards. I think even in the early 1960s, if you'd said to the original developers of laser systems, we're going to send one of your lasers and we're going to bounce it off the moon, um, yeah. they, they wouldn't have thought that was possible. But when NASA began its program to do the lunar laser ranging in the late 1960s, that's exactly what they did. And they took the best technology they could at that time and decided, let's measure to the moon. Now, there's some fantastic physics goes into being able to measure to the moon. And that entire experiment uh, popularized the idea of a, uh, a laser that can be used to measure distance, long distances with high precision. And it, it, it almost sparked the imagination in the sense that now you could reach out and touch something that's far away, like the moon. Yeah. Yes. And you can yes. find out things about it without having to go there. And people suddenly realized that light is more than just something that flashes through the air, but can become a sensor, can become a detector, can become an active device to work in your hands rather than something that's passive. So, sorry, so, so, so how did, I mean, because before that, I mean, we, you know, radar was being used prolifically, you know, in terms of some of these measurements. Um, I do know that the switch from, from um, radio waves to light, um, radar to LIDAR to brought a whole lot of accuracy, but maybe just share us some thoughts on what could have driven some of these decisions and what were some of the difficulties? You know, if you considering a satellite in space or the moon, um, why, why go the route of using LIDAR and light rather than the traditional, which were pretty well established then, um, radar and, and, and microwave technologies? Yeah, it's, it's not a simple answer. And, you know, intuitively, when you look at it, you think, well, we can get a lot of power out of radar, we can do many things with it. Mm. But it turns out there was one limitation with radar, and that was the antenna. That if you wanted to get good range out of a radar, you had to have a big antenna. And the reason is because radar waves are, are relatively long. When I say relatively long, from centimeters to meters, that kind of wavelength. Okay. And there's a rule of physics that says if you want to confine that those waves into a beam, a parallel beam of some sort, you need to have an antenna that is many wavelengths across, hundreds or thousands of wavelengths across. So if you have a long wavelength, you need a massive antenna. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, suppose you want to hit a spot on the moon. You need to have a very confined beam, something that has a small area. Otherwise, you don't know which spot you're hitting. You could be hitting the Atlas Mountains when you're, you're aiming for the landing site of Apollo 11. Yeah. Um, so the only way to confine it is to either use an enormous antenna and places like the Arecibo Space uh, uh, Research Facility is an example of an yeah. enormous antenna. Alternatively, you can use a shorter wavelength. 
And this is what lasers brought to the party, is the ability to have a short wavelength, high energy emitter, where you're now capable of confining the beam right down to the minimum divergence defined by the laws of physics. Now, don't get me wrong. If you send a beam like that, even using the world's best optics to the moon, it, by the time it hits the moon, it's almost 50 kilometers across. It's, it's still a very yes. big beam. Yeah. Yeah. But the equivalent using a radar system could be thousands of kilometers across. So wow. you, you certainly lose a lot of resolution. Now, how does that affect the design of a LIDAR system, a modern LIDAR system? Well, we don't use the word antenna in terms of the design of a LIDAR. We use the word lens. And a lens is a collimating element for light in the same way that an antenna is a collimating element for a radar system. Right. But we can use much smaller lenses because it's light than we could do if we were using a radar system. So in fact, it's possible to make a LiDAR with lenses that are only a few millimeters across, for example, um, which if you were trying to do that with a radar system, would literally the laws of physics would preclude you from having a narrow beam. You'd end up with a very, very wide beam and yeah. therefore very poor angular precision. I'd, I'd love to come back to this topic. I think it's so interesting because you look at the first LiDAR that was designed in terms of the handheld LiDAR, and it looks like a massive rifle um, with these big scopes. And, um, and I mean, I know today that there are LiDAR systems which are just the size of a coin. Um, I'd, I'd love to come back to that topic and just understand what's changed. But looking back, you know, we look at Apollo 15 and I mean, in the 70s is really when LiDAR became a lot more famous. Um, and, and that really still is kind of distance measurement. What was the evolution from there, um, where we had mainly kind of government-run, military-run, big space program LIDARs? Um, what was the next phase? I mean, was it, was it growing into space? Did it then turn to, to weather? I mean, where, where did we go from there? I'm, I'd love your, um, your insight. Well, it, it looks like there were two fundamental um, directions. Um, the mm. word LIDAR was really coined to deal with um, laser range finding systems that were design, designed to measure the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, they were looking at aerosols, um, particle, particles, uh, and clouds, and so on. Um, right. So these were relatively large things, sort of something you'd put on the back of a truck, uh, you know, relatively big systems. Yes. They were often permanently mounted and used by weather services and weather stations. Um, and the word LIDAR was used for that. Interestingly enough, the word laser rangefinder was used for almost everything else up until the last few years, where the word LIDAR has sort of become popularized to mean anything that has a laser rangefinding device right. in it. Right. And on laser rangefinder, the main direction was that of survey work. What they discovered is because of the angular precision, in other words, you could aim precisely, it meant that when you were doing something like um, measuring up a, a new area to, let's say, build a house or lay a road or something like that, you could get very accurate position information as well as distance information. So it was a great improvement and it was much quicker than, than doing it in the old, the old fashioned way with the theodolites and so on. Yes. Yeah, so it was, a, it was a big step forward for the survey and eventually, of course, that evolved into scanning survey where instead of mechanically aiming the laser rangefinder, you would actually physically uh, use a mirror to steer the beam or something like that. Mm, and mm. some very large, very expensive survey equipment was developed in the 1980s, for example, which produced beautiful 3D maps. Um, but I must admit, the, the interest from my point of view at, at that time was, why are these systems so big? Do they really have to be that big? Could we do something about that? And I think that that has... Um, uh, stimulated a lot of people to think uh, of ways of um, reducing the complexity and the cost and the size and so on. And, and, and I think the world we find ourselves in, to, in today is, is the culmination of that evolution where the big um, weather type LIDARs and the mm. ground stations, the total stations as they used to call them, have kind of morphed into something very different to solve different kinds of problems. So, James, that's interesting. I, um, you know, just part of the discussion, picking up that there was a, a, an evolution from point, point laser measurement, range finding to the moon, to satellites. And then suddenly we had these arrays of beams um, measuring topographies and measuring clouds. 
So that's interesting in terms of the evolution. Where, where, does, that, um, where does that take us today in terms of how um, applications of LiDAR have progressed? Well, I think what it demonstrates is the versatility of the whole LiDAR concept, that you can have single points, you can have scanned beams, you can have complete three-dimensional arrays of information to generate what are known as point clouds, where you can have um, yes. solid information from surfaces, not just distance information. And right. the, the moment you understand that capability and you can see that things like range are not a fundamental limitation because you can measure all the way to the moon, even accuracy yeah. can be incredibly high. Um, it's now a question of, so what problem would you like to solve? And what problem do you have? Mm. And about 10 years ago, around 2010, suddenly everyone began to realize that it was possible to do far more with this LiDAR technology, as it became known then, than people had ever thought before. So people wanted to measure everything, stockpiles of materials in industrial applications. They wanted to measure children walking under interactive artworks, which would play music as they came past. People wanted to fly drones and see how high above the ground the drone was so that it could terrain follow. Uh, people wanted to drive cars autonomously. People wanted Internet of Things where there were smart sensors and so on. And for every one of these kinds of applications, the notion of using light as the sensor became a, a core component. And uh, in everything that I've mentioned there, there are now LiDAR systems that will do precisely that kind of job. And they do it extremely well. But the challenge, of course, now is to make these kinds of products at a, a really good price so that commercially everyone can get their hands on them and make them readily available as well. And this becomes the exciting part of the commercialization of LiDAR, which I suspect is a different conversation. Thank you, James. That leaves us with lots of food for thought. Um, I hope that our viewers and our listeners have found the, um, the time with us interesting and engaging today. Please feel free to respond on our social channels, which you can find on www.lightwaylidar.com. I look forward to our next discussion where we will be finding out more about what makes a laser a laser and why do we use lasers in LIDAR systems.